Good morning all, it's great to be with you. Uh, my name's Ben and I serve as a student minister here at Holy Trinity. Um, and today we're continuing on in our short series over January, looking at the really famous Old Testament story of Jonah. Now, if you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, uh, we've followed along as we heard the story of a reluctant prophet, uh, one who was called upon by God with a mission to go, to get up, and go to this great foreign city with a message to declare. And Jonah heard the first part. He, he got up, but he went in the opposite direction, not listening to God. Instead, he tried to run away, and he put his own life and all the lives of the sailors that he was with in danger when he fled on a ship to Tarshish. Uh, but God caught him, and very soon he was thrown overboard into the raging sea, and that could have been the end of our story. But we got chapter 2. In chapter 2, we had this remarkable event where Jonah is swallowed by a great fish and he shouldn't have survived. But three days later, according to God's mercy, he was released. He was spat up onto dry ground, probably sticky and wet, and he probably made his way home. And that could have been the end of Jonah. But again, we're only halfway through the book and we've got a lot more to find out about the character of our great God together. But I wonder, if you could go back, go back and restart your life, do everything over again, knowing all the different things that you know now, knowing the things, that, the lessons you've learned, the mistakes you've made, I wonder, what would you change? Because as we come to Jonah chapter 3 now, Jonah's been through that experience and he's got a second chance. Um, will Jonah do things differently? Has his experience of God's mercy changed things for him? Well, let me pray, and then we'll have a look at this wonderful account of God's mercy together. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are good and gracious and beyond all our comprehension, and yet you have chosen to make yourself known through your word. And so, Lord, we ask that today you would help us to hear you speak clearly. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Uh, we'll be looking at the whole of Jonah 3 today and we'll be using these three headings. First of all, that God's mercy is in a fresh start. Secondly, God's mercy is in the message proclaimed. And then finally, God's mercy is in repentance. Uh, chapter 3 starts in a remarkably similar way to chapter 1 of Jonah, indicating that we really have come to a fresh start in the story. Uh, if you've got your Bibles in front of you, it'd be great to follow along. We're at chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. We've started the story in a very similar way. We've started all the way back at the beginning. Notice how similar the language is between chapter, the opening in chapter 1 and this opening in chapter 3. On the slide behind me here, I've used the CSV just to help us really see the, the similarities between the languages being used. We can see there the opening is exactly the same. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And the instructions the same too, to get up, go, go to that great city of Nineveh and preach. And to begin with, Jonah's action is exactly the same too. His response, in both cases, he gets up. But the difference comes in where he goes to after this. See, in chapter 1, Jonah got up and he fled west, out into the sea. And that didn't end up going particularly well for him. But this time, he's got up and he's gone to Nineveh, towards the east. This is, this is what we'd expect, isn't it? See, when someone experiences the mercy of God for themselves, we'd expect that that would change the way that they'd live that their life should really be turned around. And that's what's happened quite literally for Jonah. Before he was going in one direction and, and now he's literally going the opposite direction. He's changed from walking against God's will to going with God's will. But isn't it incredible that this reset has even happened in the first place? I mean, Jonah was hardly the kind of person who's proved that he's going to be a trustworthy prophet in the first place. See, when God called him before, he did the opposite of what God had asked him to do. And yet God rescued him. He set him on dry ground and gave him a fresh start. Now, did Jonah deserve to be rescued from drowning? 
No. Uh, He'd just told God to get lost. Did Jonah deserve a second chance at this mission? No way. He hasn't done anything in between these two chapters to prove that he's going to do a better job this time around. And yet God has shown him mercy. He's given him what he doesn't deserve. Experiencing that kind of mercy should bring about change in a person. But just how comprehensive has this change been for Jonah? Only time will tell, and we'll really see over these next couple of chapters how deep this change has gone. We're at point two for now, though. God's mercy is in the message proclaimed. Take a look at the next couple of verses with me in verses three to four. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Notice it's a really big deal for Jonah to go all the way to Nineveh. Uh, We're not talking about going from here up to Blackheath. Uh, This isn't going to a small rural town. Jonah here is being asked to go to one of the largest cities of the known world at the time. And he's not the kind of guy that has any right or authority being there. Imagine it, he's he's a guy who's travelled across multiple nations and territories from a place that's not even a player on the global scale during this time. He's gone to the soon-to-be capital of the reigning empire. At minimum, it takes him 20 days to walk there if he's walking 12 hours a day, according to modern roads on Google Maps, so it's probably taken him even longer. And by the time he gets there, it takes a whole day for him to walk in, and he's not even made it halfway through the city yet. And when he gets there, he starts to deliver a shocking message to the people around him. He declares to everyone who can hear, 40 days time, this place will be overturned. It's going to happen. You guys are all going to get it. And that's the end of Jonah for chapter 3. He's only there for a really brief time. We're not told any more about what else he did in the city, any more words he might have spoken, even who he spoke to, just this very short message of doom. I wonder if you've ever been outside town hall before, maybe in Circular Quay, and you've heard people or even seen people preaching in this kind of way. Uh, Maybe they look a little bit like this with the big sandwich board and maybe a Bible verse or just some really bold statement written on it. How are the people who are walking by them and around them reacting towards these kinds of people? If your experience is anything like mine, um, you're seeing not many people stopping for wholehearted conversation, uh, rather a lot of people stopping their ears and walking on by. Um, If you're anything like me, I wonder what your experience has been personally. I know I often will just walk on by, turning my head, maybe even a little bit embarrassed. Now, we actually know when we think about it that often what these people are speaking are true things. Um, Now, they may not be speaking true things in a very loving way. Uh, Perhaps it's not the most strategic or eloquent form of evangelism. But they're often speaking true things. And Jonah here, he seems to be doing a very similar kind of thing. See, Jonah isn't an Australian speaking to other Australians about incoming doom, though. What he's doing is far more extreme He's a foreigner, an Israelite, speaking to the incoming superpower of the day and telling them, you guys here, you're all about to get smashed. So I wonder what Jonah was hoping was going to happen with this message. See, it's interesting to notice what isn't recorded here. Jonah proclaims incoming doom, but he doesn't tell the Ninevites how to respond to that judgment. He doesn't go and present two ways to live to them. Um, He doesn't say, judgment is coming, but don't worry, I know God, he's a merciful God, I've experienced his mercy for myself, and he will show mercy to you if you repent. No, instead, as far as we have in front of us, Jonah doesn't seem to be making any real effort to help the people of Nineveh at all. Rather, it's almost as if he's gloating over them. And you can kind of understand why if you understand who Jonah is as an Israelite and who Nineveh are. See, Israel is being beat up on over and over by all these surrounding nations. And all these nations, they don't know God. They're all so immoral. They deserve God's judgment. And so when Jonah gets this message of doom, I wonder if in a way he's kind of happy about it. 
we'll get to take a bit of a closer look into what's going on in Jonah's head and what he was hoping for next week in chapter 4. So there's some encouragement to come back for that. But for now, what kind of results would you expect this message of doom to have? If we put our minds back to that example of the preacher in Circular Key, we'd expect this kind of message to be laughed at or probably just ignored. If we consider how similar messages were received by Israel and Judah by their own prophets, we'd expect probably rejection, hostility, violence and maybe even death. But the result here in Nineveh is really surprising. Have a look. Verse 5 the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, maybe we're so used to this story that this doesn't surprise us, but it should. This isn't the normal kind of response we would expect. I mean, put yourself in the Ninevites' shoes here. They've believed a messenger who they had never heard of, who's talking about a God who's going to judge them whom they've never heard of, and they believe him, and they actually respond in changing their lives around that message as well. What can explain this kind of response? Well, there's all sorts of different things that we could use to try to explain this miraculous response. Uh, We could have a really close look at the geopolitical climate in Nineveh uh, during this time when Jonah was preaching there. Uh, We might find some really interesting things about maybe some political unrest that might have made it really easy for Jonah to introduce this message of doom. But the person writing this account doesn't attribute it to that. Or we could predict what kind of natural phenomena was happening just before Jonah arrived, so maybe they would have been a bit more receptive to a messenger from God. Perhaps there was an eclipse or maybe a meteor shower or something like that. But again, the writer, he doesn't attribute their response to that either. Or what's going on? I think what's happening here is a very similar thing to what's happening in chapter 2. See, in chapter 2, we had another remarkable event take place. Um, After being tossed overboard, Jonah is is plummeting towards the depths of the sea, and he's swallowed by a great fish and vomited up onto dry ground. Now, none of that in of itself is remarkable until we add the fact that he's vomited up onto dry ground alive three days later. Now, again, maybe we're so used to the story that this doesn't surprise us, but again, it really should. Perhaps we've got in our head something that looks like this from Pinocchio Geppetto sitting in, the, in a big whale, fishing with his cat, kind of just waiting until his puppet son comes along to rescue him. Or perhaps we've been uh, good parents and kids reading our kids' children's Bibles and we've got nice pictures like this with Jonah praying to God inside the belly of a fish and even the prawns praying along with him. Um, they're nice pictures, but they don't capture what's really going on. This isn't what it's like inside a fish. Um, Quite simply, they miss the point. It's not possible to survive in a fish underwater for three days. Uh, There's no point trying to discover some kind of secret scientific explanation for how it might have been able to happen. Or maybe if there's a modern day equivalent that kind of proves it's happening. Uh, The best I saw on Google was um, in the past couple of years, a Jonah experience where someone was swallowed by a whale and then got spat out again. And they told their story about how they'd been inside the mouth of this whale for about 30 seconds and survived. (laughs) But three days. The only thing we can attribute Jonah's survival to is the mercy of God. Nothing else. No one else could have saved him. And so when we come to chapter 3, the only thing we can attribute Nineveh's response to is the mercy of God. And friends, when we understand this, this should be such an encouragement to us that even through weakness, even though we can't see any possible way of someone coming to know Jesus, coming to have salvation with God, it's not about our human efforts Because nothing is impossible with God. People hear the message, our weak and feeble message, only by the mercy of God. But it doesn't stop with hearing. God's mercy also means that that message will go on to take effect. 
But our final point now, God's mercy is in repentance. Have a look at the result of what happened after the Ninevites had heard this message and believed God. Verses 6 to 9. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat, sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat, anything, eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Jonah's short message of doom has made its way to the very top. It's reached the ears of the king of the city, the most powerful man in the empire. And so it's astonishing with what magnitude he humbles himself in such a dramatic fashion. Notice he gets up from his throne, he takes off his royal robes, these symbols of his status before the people, and he replaces them, he puts on sackcloth, itchy and uncomfortable, the kind of thing that a beggar might have to resort to wearing, and he sits back down, not on his throne, but in the dirt. You couldn't find a bigger change in a person. It's dramatic and it's very visual, but it's only a symbol of what's going on in his heart. And we get a better insight into that as we look into the decree that he issues. See, not only does he humble himself, he also leads the whole city to repentance as well. And notice everyone, even the animals, need to humble themselves before God, taking away their pride, replacing it with lowliness, recognizing their condemnation before him. But it doesn't stop there. Because they also cry out to God and they repent. They turn away from an old way of living in order to go a new way. And that's what repentance is. It's to be going in one direction, to stop, to turn around and to walk in a brand new direction. The Ninevites have abandoned their old way of living, of violence, of evil, and probably even of ignorance because they've heard this message from God, that he's going to judge them for their wickedness. In the face of judgment, humility and repentance, it's the only sane choice to make. What were the Ninevites hoping for? What were they hoping would come about of this repentance? Well, they were hoping that God would continue to show them mercy. But what kind of confidence did they have about it? Have a look again at verse 9. They said, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. What level of confidence did they have? Well, not a lot. And actually rightly so. See, they know that they've stuffed up. They know they rightly deserve condemnation. If God's going to give them what they deserve, all they're going to experience is death. They shouldn't expect to be given any kind of mercy. Somehow I think if you're used to going to church and have been around Christian circles for a long time, we might forget just how radical the concept of mercy is in the gospel. Um, To give someone not the punishment they rightly deserve, but instead give total forgiveness, it's so radical that we don't realize how big a deal it is That God does indeed give mercy. Have a look in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. What is it that God sees? Well, he doesn't see the putting on of sackcloth. He doesn't see the fasting. He sees repentance. And what does he do when he sees that repentance? Well, he relents. Or you could even say he repents. See, when we turn our back on our old way of life, when we confess our sin and come before God in repentance, God himself turns away from the judgment that we rightly deserve. 
That's who he is. Now, God is right and just to punish the wicked. He would actually be an evil God if he just left evil alone and never brought it to justice. And yet at the same time, God is fully a God of mercy. We've seen that mercy today extended in three different ways. It's extended towards people like Jonah who didn't deserve a second chance, and yet God brought him to salvation. We've seen that mercy extended toward the people of Nineveh in even revealing his oncoming judgment to them. And we've seen that mercy displayed so richly towards those that turn in repentance towards him, forgiving them completely. So friends, the question remains, how will you respond to that mercy? Perhaps you're someone and you've been running away from God, perhaps even for a really long time, and you think to yourself, surely God could never show mercy to someone like me. Of course he can, because that's who God is. He delights to show mercy. Or perhaps you're someone here and you've heard this message of doom and God's judgment maybe even many times, but for you, you're really proud and humbling yourself before God, admitting your faults, it's probably the hardest thing that you could think of doing. But can I encourage you, it's the only way to find forgiveness. So please turn to him and find his mercy before it's too late. Or perhaps like the Ninevites, you're really hoping that God will show mercy, but you're not really sure if it's something that you'll receive for yourself. Perhaps you've turned away from an old way of living and you want to live a better life, but you're still not sure. Have you done enough? Have you really repented enough? Well, friends, it's not what we do, not the outward symbols or the signs of our repentance that attract God's mercy towards us. It's not the putting on of sackcloth or fasting or attending church a flawless number of times. No, God is merciful in of himself. We only need to turn to him in repentance. And that's the exhortation that the Apostle John gives his audience in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. It's the New Testament reading we had. And we're going to finish here as well. So hear this exhortation of the confidence that we can have in the mercy of God shown to those who repent. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Come to God in repentance. Come to a God who delights to show mercy, who lavishes out forgiveness. Because Jesus has died to wipe away your debt. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are altogether righteous, altogether holy, and altogether merciful. Lord, we have all turned our backs on you. We've lived lives of wickedness, of evil, and of violence. So, Lord, we ask that you would show us mercy. Thank you that in Jesus we have the assurance of complete forgiveness. We ask that you would help us to live lives characterized by the grace that you have shown to us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're open to the floor. Who'd like to serve us by putting up a hand? <clears throat> We've got Tom. Tom first. Now I've got it. Do you want you to repeat it? Yeah, I can answer that. Yep. Come back next yeah, week. Repeat. We're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> repeat question, the question is question is, why was Jonah so against the Ninevites repenting? Um, come back next week. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there, that's it, that's it. Charlie.
Yeah. For sure. Um, a couple of things you could say. Do you want to, so you want to yep. repeat? Um, so how do what? So how do we explain the their particular expression of their response in light of such a short message from Jonah? So Jonah doesn't say put on sackcloth, have a fast, or anything like that. Um, they kind of just do it. Um, a couple of things to say. First of all, what we have here is re- recorded is recorded for a particular purpose. Um, that's not to say this is exactly the word-for-word only thing that Jonah said. So there might have been other things that Jonah said which could have led to that. But we don't know that, and so we can't say that that's why they do it. Okay. Um, I think we see some interesting things here that make me think it's not super Jewish. For example, the whole city, even the animals, put on sackcloth. Now, that's, that's weird. Um, that's something that, like the whole city... The animals don't need to repent, but somehow that's something that they've understood that they're doing. I, I doubt Jonah's going to go through and start telling the animals to repent too, but they're taking that on board. Um, but the symbols that they do, they're outward symbols of an internal reality. They're humbling themselves, um, saying, yes, we're wrong. Right, you've got us, we're wrong, and they're admitting their faults. Uh, We see that most clearly in the king, in his expression of humility, um, but the way in which they explicitly turn away from their evil, um, the the similar to the opening in chapter 1, how the evil of the Ninevites has gone up to God, that same evil is what they've turned away from. Uh, But again, the writer is highlighting similar words to say the evil that they had there is the evil that they're turning away from here. Um, There's a bunch in that. I'm not sure that's particularly helpful. <laughs> good question, good response. Thank you. Okay, Jane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. yeah. It's a helpful thing to consider. What's written here has been written for a particular purpose, and the writer has an aim as they're writing. And so, really, you know, they're not just haphazardly writing things down, they've got a goal. And so, while we have, might have these other things we might want to know, we may actually never know for sure. Um, but we're trying to find out what, what is really going on here. What's the real goal that's happening here? All right, Ben, I might ask you more. Oh, there's one more. Okay, one more. Yeah, okay. Sandra. So there's a photo of two men in different oral traditions. Mm. And Jonah is joking with this photo. Mm. Do we expect judgment? Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the sandwich board guys, they're preaching judgment. Jonah preaches judgment. Do we need to preach more judgment? I think at one level, yes. Um, if, if people don't know the judgment of God, then there's no chance for them to repent uh, because they're not turning away from it. They don't know they need to turn away from anything. Um, it's only by the mercy of God that he even reveals his judgment to humanity. He has every right just to kill everyone now, smite everyone now, judge everyone. Uh, but in his mercy, he's patient. Uh, he's giving time for people to repent. Um, so I think we should. We need, we need to let people know of God's right judgment towards them. That's not an evil thing of God. That's, that's a good and right thing of God. Um, and yet at the same time, um, to do what Jonah did and just tell them about judgment, um, God can work through that. I'm not sure if we then take that as a model of how we do our own preaching. Uh, I think we want to let people know as well about the character of our God, that he is entirely just and right to judge, but he's entirely merciful as well and loves to forgive. Um, and we need to let people know both, and the gospel without either one of those becomes really hollow. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll close there. Very good questions, very good discussion, and often question time stimulates more thought, more discussion. Please chat to each other. Have a morning tea. Please keep chatting with Ben. Uh, lots to talk about, isn't there? When we hear God's word and we reflect on what it says.